Welcome to Revolution Against Evolution. I'm your host, Doug Sharp. I'm your co-host, Rich Gear here with you as well. And uh, today, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, well, some trips we've made, and especially Doug, you just made one, out to Arizona. Yeah. And he's going to explain the title. What is the title, Doug? The, the title is, Does Water Flow Off Hill? Yeah, okay, so we need a little explanation. I'm sure it will be forthcoming, because I haven't got a clue, folks. Uh, you know? <laughs> so, okay. Well, well, what I'm really talking about is the Grand Canyon. Uh, because uh, that was one of the places that we went on our little trip and, and on this one uh, we I brought my son-in-law, my daughter and uh, two grandchildren along with me and mm -hmm. this is the first time they've been out there so we wow. uh, had a, a great time in finding out when my grandchildren are are, are really get into the hiking and climbing and the, uh, all so the Karen's water. never been out to the Grand Canyon either? Karen's been out there. She's been there, okay. So well, Linda's never been there. Okay, all right. Linda was there too, but uh, um, Ted hadn't been there and uh, uh, the two grandkids haven't. So Okay, well they're a little low. Okay. Uh, but the reason yeah. I talk about water flowing uphill is that uh, there's a lot of theories about the formation of the Grand Canyon mm -hmm. and uh, None of them really make a whole lot of sense in terms of the long, gradual ages uh, of the Earth scenario. Oh, uh, right. Because uh, um, if you uh, take a look at the Grand Canyon, you have to actually go uh, go to about 8,000 foot level, uh, which is where the uh, uh, where the Grand Canyon Village is, uh, and, and so there's a marker there that says like. 8,400 feet or something like that. Above sea level? Oh, is above it? sea level, okay. yeah. And then, right. then the uh, north rim is actually a little bit higher than the south rim. You're talking about the, at, the, at the where the canyon is, at, at the base yeah, of the canyon? Yeah, at the lip of the canyon where, okay. uh, and then uh, it cuts down about a mile uh, in, into the canyon floor. So okay. uh, what you, what they are, they've been trying to figure out is uh, is it possible for uh, this canyon to be cut by this uh, this river, the Grand uh, Colorado, Colorado River? River? Yeah, and, yeah. And uh, there was, uh, I guess, the first uh, uh, first theory that was proposed was the antecedent river theory, where where uh, you have this, uh, you know, the Colorado River as it cuts into the uh, it cuts the canyon, the, the actual uh, Colorado Plateau, Plateau was rising. Oh, yeah, right, okay. <clears throat> so, in other words, the water staying kind of where it is, right. maybe a little bit down, but the canyon, there's there's uplifts or something happening. Yeah, so as, uh, as the okay. canyon is being cut, uh, you know, it's uh, going through this, uh, actually, when you look at it, it's going through a mountain there because uh, you have. Uh, all this elevation on both sides of the canyon. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when you uh, leave the Grand Canyon and go uh, east towards uh, Cameron, which is the right. Navajo training, training post, yeah. uh, you uh, descend almost 2,000 feet in elevation as you're going down into the Painted Desert area. Oh, yeah. And, you know, the interesting thing of it is you can take a look at the Little Colorado River, which is uh, a canyon that actually flows into uh, the Grand Canyon. And at the uh, edge of the Grand Canyon, it's all it's high, but over at the, Cam the Cameron area, it's pretty much uh, level. There's not much of a, of a cut at all at the, at the base of that river and so it's actually trying to go uphill. Oh, now we get to the crux. <coughs> okay. All right. You have to actually make it go uphill in order for it to uh, cut into the Grand Canyon and empty in the Grand Canyon. So uh, they, they were coming up with a theory where uh, it was sort of cutting backwards, you know, uh, where they were, huh? it was flowing backwards of, what it, of the way it is now. Oh, I see. It's reverse. It's reverse direction yeah. today, but in in the past or when it was being formed, right. it was slow in the other direction. So it was actually 
It was originally flown downhill. Okay, uh, that's the that's the evolutionist explain, explanation. Yeah, we don't buy any of it, but we got right. but you, he's got to keep up on what's. I mean, they, well, you know, it keeps going back to thinking about how ridiculous a theory is. As long as it doesn't involve God or the Bible being accurate, mm -hmm. we'll we'll take that above anything else. So okay. Yeah, and there, there's another theory which um, actually uh, uh, both evolutionists and creationists have proposed. Okay. And that's uh, the. Uh, uh, Canyon Lake and Hopi Lake uh, ideas is that this is a breach dam. Breach dam theory, yeah. And, you know, that has some potential of explaining it, but I don't think it actually uh, does the whole explanation very well. But it is interesting, though, because some of the, 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 old, the Indian stories talk about how they were fishing and then suddenly the Grand Canyon appears. I mean, I mean it's maybe simplistic. Yeah, it's sort of, uh, everything right? drains down through a hole. A hole, and then out comes the Grand Canyon. And of course, that's obviously, you know, truncating the events quite a bit, but it, it kind of indicates something in living memory that happened that formed this canyon. You know, we, 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 we've talked many times over the years about the idea that just because language is sort of uh, poetically expressed or or symbolically or even allegorically that they didn't know what they were talking about when this was happening. The traditions uh, and the stories that has helped them remember the events, uh, although I grant, grant over, over many hundreds of years they could be, you know, somewhat, uh, you know, mythologized or embellished or, or even details forgotten, but still the basic gist of it seems to be what the creationists would say that this was a, a cataclysmic uh, uh, probably event that happened post flood, after the rock, after the layers had been laid down, but the ground was still fairly plastic and soft, mm -hmm. and uh, there were some areas that were harder than others. And when the water flows in, because you can you actually see it when you look at the charts above, above, and you look at down, you see where the lakes. And when you and I would drove out there, remember those some of those areas? It looked like remember that old song, America. Where I've been in the desert with you know, with a horse with no name, or what? How's it goes? That desert is this, is a is a river or a or a water with its life underground. In other words, and you looked at it, and you could almost see how this might have been all a lake at one time. You know, it looked. I mean, there were areas, the canyon wall, the, not the canyons, but the slopes of it, where it seemed like where the where, it, even though it's all dry, it looked like it's the basin of what might have once been a, a lake. Well, there are uh, areas like that out there. I, I think creationists are starting to um, abandon this because uh, they were actually been out, out there doing uh, looking for this lake bed. Okay. And uh, they're actually not finding it. So they're not, they're not thinking it is? They're not thinking it what is. Are they, what are they thinking? Well, there, like I said, there's uh, maybe about uh, half a dozen different creation models that are get, yeah. getting proposed here. But the, the one I like, uh, I think, uh, which it makes a lot of sense to me, is that of uh, Michael Lord, is that we, uh, you know, where you have multiple waves of deposition during the flood. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, well, this yeah. is a, a total global flood uh, where all of this was underwater. Right. And so what you, uh, then after, uh, then there's a sort of like a, a shift in the, the sea floor where you have the continents moving and, and the, the sea floor is basalt, which is uh, heavier and it sinks. Mm -hmm. And the continents, which is lighter, rises up. And uh, as the continents moved over uh, towards, the, towards the west, uh, there's some buckling and there's some rising of the sediments. And that's just why you, you get a lot of the layers. You first of all get uh, various tidal uh, yeah, that, that, that's, that's consistent with pretty much all the theories, or right. most of the creationist theories. And yeah, but that was the idea of the breach dam idea, the layers over there, yeah. and then some things got cut through. But you're saying the breach dam is not as viable of a theory? You think this, what's the difference between what Ord is proposing and, and what this is? Because well, the the Ord, had this, uh, yeah. Yeah, the Ord is proposing that this was more of a uh, phenomenon that, that took place during the flood, during the... But during the, rather than after? Rather, rather than after. Really? Okay. And so the... Uh, and he, he cites this as being, uh, the, the evidence for this as being 
uh, and a lot of the other canyons that are in the world today. And you know, we also have the uh, the Brett's flood, which is uh, what happened in the uh, caused the channel uh, scablands in up in Washington, uh, in Washington State. Washington State. Yeah, no. and that would have been a lake that was bigger than Lake Ontario uh, that would have drained uh, catastrophically uh, through the glacier. Uh, yeah, at, at that time. I guess I guess I always thought that the breach dam theory guys. I'm not trying to hold on to something because mm -hmm. if something's better, but it, it seems similar to that that they use that as an example of how the breach dam could have happened. So I, right. I guess I didn't you know didn't see how. In other words, you're saying the canyon was maybe being formed while it was all underwater. Yes, and okay. it, as it was draining off. So you think the Hopi legends are probably have nothing to do with anything, and maybe something totally different. Well, the Hopi legends uh, probably has something to do with it, uh, but uh, I think it has a lot to do with uh, their their flood legend. Okay, that's and fair enough. Yeah, I mean, you and I made that made that. Well, at least I, I was looking at when we were looking when we were out there at the uh, the old uh, kivas, mm -hmm. and you could see remnants of flood stories in their right. own old ideas where they were they were in a world that was covered in water, and they right. saw this hole in the sky. They walk through it and they come into the overland, which is right. now where we are now, which reminds me of a, a, of a, of a mythologized or, you know, a very allegorical story of when they were in this boat, they saw the whole, they saw the skylight maybe or whatever they could see and waited for the, waited for the water to go down and they come out mm -hmm. and onto the dry land, you know, all those months later. But, uh, um, so yeah, I could see how that could be, so you, the story of them, of but of them like fishing on the lake, and then it goes into this hole. That always that always intrigues me. I'm going because uh, yeah. you know where that that always that's where the breach dam theory got a little bit of um, anecdotal, I would say, evidence. Not evidence, mm -hmm. but uh, you know historical. You know, because we use a lot of that in, in creation still. We I mean we don't use it. There are extra biblical sources. You always take them with a grain of salt. You have to, mm -hmm. but they do give you some indicators of things of people who are in living memory remembering something. So that's, and that's another reason why a lot of people thought the Grand Canyon was post-flood because it would have been big lakes that were already there, like the Scabland things, and they were already there and then drained off. You know, I, I took uh, my grandchildren to see Sunset Crater, and uh, they'd never seen uh, uh, a volcano with lava before, you know. Yeah. And uh, so we walked around the, uh, that, that area, and of course that has a Hopi legend uh, yeah, uh, associated with it, and uh, the Hopi legend dates to, to maybe a uh, uh, thousand A.D. Mm -hmm. uh, where that eruption took place. Uh, although uh, before they found out about the Hopi legend, they had uh, uh, done some radiometric dating uh, yeah. of it, and uh, they, they thought it was millions of years old. So is that that's not no? That's, is it that area? I'm trying to where's the KT boundary supposedly? The, the whole the, the, the thing the Cretaceous ends, you know, 65 million years ago, and there's like volcanic, there's, these, there's a layer, maybe it has nothing to do with it. I'm just trying to think. It seems to me it was Sunset Crater or someplace out there where they were where they were using that as some reason why the Cretaceous extinction happened, you know what I'm saying? No, it wasn't that. It, it was, was the, the Chicxulub uh, Crater in the Yucatan. Yeah, I know that one, but I thought there was something up in Arizona, but maybe I'm... Maybe I'm conflating something else, which is fine. I do that. I do that all the time, folks. It's just I got to keep them honest. That's all, you know. So anyway, but uh, but I know about that one. I, I but I thought it was something in Arizona, but maybe I'm, you know. Anyway, no, but, that would that would have been about 800 years ago. Well, I know that. I know the actual the Hopis. The story, actual story, when it happened, but I thought there was something they were talking about much earlier. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, they're trying to use it for certain evolutionary theories. Anyway, for right. long ages. But anyway, so well, how they like the Sunset Crater. Well, uh, they had a, a chance to climb around on the different uh, yeah. uh, formations there, and uh, it was actually a little bit cold. We had uh, we had a day where uh, it was it was a weather event. Oh, and, uh, yeah, okay. You know, you're talking with Flagstaff, and Flagstaff is hot. Uh, yeah, and and so it's cold there. we were uh, we first went to Walnut Canyon and. Uh, we climbed around there and uh, saw a lot of the Indian ruins. We took the same path that you and I took. Hey, Vivian went out there with you? Vivian went out there with me. Wow, she doesn't like that much, you know? Yeah, she did uh, climb down there. Okay. 
Right. What about uh, Linda and uh, Kayla find out? Linda likes hiking. She does. And she loves Kayla, uh, Kayla, we find she she loves loves to climb. Oh, does she? Yeah. And so, um, and when we got to Wupapki, uh, we saw these clouds just roiling in. Yeah. And uh, we we just say, well, we we better get going back to to the hotel before. This hits. We have cloudburst or something. Yeah, well, it was a little bit more than a cloudburst. Uh, we did get back to the hotel, and then uh, it just started raining these pellets of hail and uh, snow. Really? Well, how yeah. big were the pellets? Were they big? Yeah, they were like uh, uh, pea size. That yeah. hurt. And so we uh, we ended up with about an inch of snow, and <laughs> and so. Um, you don't go out to Arizona for snow, but uh, well, I mean, but you go to Flagstaff, Doug. I remember we went out there in Grand Canyon, and, and it was cold. I remember, it was in, and it was in April, mm -hmm. and uh, it was snowing uh, on the ground. And you got to go down to Phoenix, where then it got it got nice and warm, you know. Yeah. But even there, I was still a little chilly there when we were there that, that one time. So, yeah. But, and uh, in classic uh, creationist literature. And some of the things they talk about in uh, in the Creation Research Society quarterly was uh, an area in the Grand Canyon where you have the Mississippian layer, and then there's a, a Cambrian layer, and you have Mississippian again, the Cambrian. Again. Yeah. Uh, and that's they like shuffle like a deck of cards. A, a little bit, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, that that's a problem. Now, um, I remember. Uh, we had a, I had a guy challenge me on that. He says, so, uh, don't you know that there's the Temple Butte formation that's in between them? Well, I, I said, well, it's, uh, you sometimes find it and sometimes don't. <laughs> and uh, that's because uh, it sort of uh, pinches off in certain areas. And, and in this case, you have <coughs> these mixtures of these two layers. They're supposed to be 100, uh, 200 million years apart. And, but they're all uh, intertwined like this in, in a couple areas. You, you find this on the North Kaibab Trail. And I found out that when we were there that the, the North Kaibab Trail has been closed off for some reason. Oh, really? They've, uh, I guess they had a landslide or something where okay. the, they couldn't uh, maintain the trail. And so <clears throat> um, if you go out there and, and you want to hike across the Grand Canyon on the Kaibab Trail, that's, that's a problem. Are they going to clear it out? Yeah, they, they, were, they were working on it when okay. we were there. But uh, uh, the other interesting thing is when we went to uh, Sedona, uh, we had Guy Forsyth. He took us to, to a, a new place, which I had never been to. It's mm -hmm. called Fay Canyon. And this is a relatively easy trail. You know, it's all flat. Um, and you're going about a mile, and then you go up, it, it's a box canyon, and so you go up to oh. the, the edge of it, and then, then you can climb up the wall of the canyon into the, um, and uh, get a good view of the whole, uh, whole area, and it's really nice. There's, and, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's an arch on the way, too. Oh, man, we love arches. <laughs> and so uh, you can see a lot of the geology in that area. But one of the things, um, I was talking about the Temple View for the nation pinching off, well, there's a, a there's a pretty a wide uh, layer in the in the Sedona area. Uh, Sedona actually uh, mimics uh, the Grand Canyon. It has the same rocks as the Grand Canyon. You see the Coconino on top and the yeah okay. Uh, the, but the, there's a, there's one layer in in Sedona called the Schnebly Hill Formation that you don't find in the Grand Canyon. And so here's a, a pretty significant layer that is unique to Sedona, but it, it's not in the Grand Canyon. Interesting. I've not heard about this, you know. What, well, do, they, what, do, they, what do they call this layer? Well, the Schnebly Hill Formation is uh, um, this layer that, that appears only in the, in the Sedona area, and it's, uh, I forget what time period that the uh, evolution is assigned to it, but the problem is that uh, here you have the sequence of layers that exist in the Grand Canyon, and now you have to fit this new new guy. Yeah, this new guy in there somewhere. Yeah. And 
I, I don't know if you remember uh, a guy talking about the Schnedley Hill Road, but uh, no. but I guess that uh, you, know, you can actually take it for a little while from Interstate 17 uh, down down to Sedona, but it's a, a, a pretty rough road. It's like a four wheeler. <laughs> okay, yeah. you don't want to go in there. Yeah, it's, it's a kind of uh, a treacherous to take. <laughs> Yeah, it's the kind of road you shouldn't be used when you're still riding horses. Yeah, uh, you can take it in uh, from uh, Sedona and go up to the wall, and you can take it down from the top and uh, go to this uh, cliff. And, but there's some pretty uh, uh, treacherous switchbacks. Yeah, I was say it sounds like switchbacks. Yeah, <clears throat> but uh, that was what was quite interesting is that uh, uh, the Schnebley Hill Formation which is in Sedona, is in the of the Grand Canyon. Well, you know, and that just beg, not to beg the question, but it's the same. We find this in, in quite a few areas where you'll find, uh, you'll have layers of certain rock and then suddenly there's a huge gap or it's flipped upside down. Mm -hmm. And the story is, you, you know, and it took me a lot of years to, I never really understood this, is that it does, it's not a matter of what kind of rock makes the layer. Right. It's what fossils are found in the right, rocks. Right, yeah. And that's something I never understood. You could have the same kind of rock, and they'll be considered completely different time periods based on one has a triceratops in it, and the other has, has uh, trilobites in it or something. It's the same kind of rock, maybe. Uh, it could be different rock, it's not, not necessarily, but it's all, it's all uh, based on what they find in it. So that's what's always confusing is in, in like, and sometimes the different rock, different rock type is a, considered a different time period as well, but it's very confusing and I don't think the lay person no, understands that. I never, never got that for years. No, I don't know that, about that stuff, you know. The fossils aren't really always found in the, uh, the sequence that the evolutionists No, expect. that's what I'm saying and that's why they call them, they put one, well the one famous one, one we talked about in Empire Mountain. No, I think it's Permian and Creek. Permian, that's what, okay. But anyway, you got hundreds of millions of years in between, mm -hmm. and then all these missing missing uh, time periods, and where do they go? And, and in this case, instead of a missing time period, you got an extra one found somewhere else. <laughs> the same, is it the same underneath, the same top? Is it the yeah, yeah. And then you got this, this one that's in Sedona, this, I, what do you, how do you pronounce it? Schnebley Hill. Schnebley Hill. Uh, that sounds just bizarre. How do you get a name like Schnebley Hill? But anyway. Uh, but the, uh, my, the classic example is Glacier National Park with Creek Camping on top, Cretaceous underneath, um, uh, the Red Rock Canyon and Valley of Fire, 75 miles apart in the yep. Las Vegas area. But the, the top layer is Cambrian, and then underneath it is Jurassic, Triassic, Permian. And, and to have that same out of order sequence, uh, yeah, there's two different yeah. places uh, over uh, uh, the 75, 75 miles. miles yeah. that, that's a, a, a real problem for evolutionists. So, uh, I, I like to collect these uh, the different these uh, anomalies. Uh, yeah, and uh, do this fault finding. Yeah, uh, with evolution, you know. You like to layer it on, right? Layer it on. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so. I know, Doug. I mean, we, we've we've visited these kinds of subjects over the years. Um, we always have to give sort of the caveat as to why we deal deal a lot with things like this geology. Mm -hmm. And really, the issue has to do with age of the earth. Okay. Right. Yeah. And age of the earth is a critical issue because we our show is revolution against evolution. And many people, if you, who if you, if you just tune in for the first time, are not really familiar with it. Um, why do you care about the geology? When you're dealing with evolution of the transmutation of one kind into another d different kind, uh, but the fact of the matter is, it's never been observed in, in in any kind of observational scientific thing. What what they proposed in evolution, so they need long periods of time to justify it. And we're just trying to tell you, even those scenarios have many, many and varied problems. Uh, in fact, the young Earth solution is much more viable in so many respects. So many ways, with, with, with catastrophism as a big part of that, so the solution. The well, problem, of course, is uh, uh, trying to uh, take what you find in the present and extrapolate yeah, into the back past. into the past. Yeah. 
uh, what could have happened to uh, to, pr to produce this sort of thing. If uh, if you take uh, uh, for example uh, the Lansing Mall, and <laughs> would you, you like go to back to uh, <laughs> go back fifty years uh, or sixty years? Sixty years, I think. Now, yeah, and uh, and try to uh, predict. Uh, what, what it was like 60 years ago, based upon what you find there today, you really can't do it because the evidence for the sharp dairy farm there is, is gone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you might, maybe you find, might find a, a missing iron bolt or something. This is what they try to do. They find little pieces, mm -hmm. the fossils or whatever, the type of rock, and they think they could put something together, but it usually falls apart like a house of cards when you have these, all these other anomalies that come up. So many things that, that are explained much better with a recent uh, young Earth scenario, you know. And so it's uh, important to understand that uh, um, by examining something in the present, you can't really uh, extrapolate back in the past and figure out to what, what it was like. And so uh, that's the reason why we uh, don't put much stock in. in well, we much rather rely on eyewitness accounts, right? An eyewitness account That's what the biblical record claims to be. It is, uh, and we believe in the God of the Bible, that uh, what the Bible says uh, makes the scientific sense. Yeah, absolutely. We'll see you next time on Revolution Against Evolution.